No. When we ask where their plan is, they don't have one. When we ask them where the jobs are, they don't know. When we ask them for leadership, they run and hide. And why? Because they're voting present when it comes to saving Medicare. I thank the gentlelady for the time tonight. Thank you so much. And now I would like to yield to the gentleman from New York. Well, I, I thank the gentlelady from Alabama for yielding time. And I, and I thank my colleagues for coming to the floor of the House tonight to stand with us as we have a discussion with the American people, an honest and open discussion. That's what we were called to do in November of this past year with a great election that brought this majority to this chamber. Because we were sick and tired of the smoke and mirrors and, and the gamemanship and the political rhetoric of yesterday. We are here today to lead. We are here today to talk in an honest and open fashion about not talking points generated from a political party, but a philosophy that will bring America back to be the land of opportunity, not only for us, but for our kids and for our grandchildren. You know, I, I love hearing the stories that my colleagues uh, are offering about constituents from their home district, about people that are suffering and that are looking for jobs. They, they're, they're, they're in the ranks of the unemployed. But I also think uh, of the people that are presently in a job, uh, people like uh, Brad Pfister and, and his wife Tammy, who are, are raising a, a beautiful young girl by the name of Alyssa. And they sit in their living rooms watching their daughter play with the, the family toys, the slinky, the, the, uh, you know, all the things that you know, we think of as the American dream, the things that we enjoy with our families. And what he's worried about is, does, will he have a job not just tomorrow, but will he have a job six months from now? Will he have a job a year from now? That uncertainty, that fear, is something that the men and women and children of America should not have to live in. Because we are the strongest nation on the face of the earth. We are the land of opportunity. So when you hear us talking here tonight, it is not about political posturing. It is about articulating a philosophy to America that we, each of us, hold dear. And the philosophy can really be, slumped, can be summed up to four points. You hear us talk a lot about the national debt. And I've been asked at town hall meetings on a regular basis, why is that such a fundamental issue? Why, why other than the threat that it presents to us as a nation, because everyone gets that, why is it so important that we get the national debt under control? And my response has always been that if you're going to create the confidence in the American market, that the, the people that are going to expend millions, billions of dollars to create that new manufacturing base in America, they got to have the confidence that the American market, that the fiscal house of the United States government is in order so that they can make that investment in a safe and secure market. So that's issue number one. Not only do we have to balance the books and get our fiscal house in order, we have to have an honest conversation about removing the excessive regulations that are being promulgated out of Washington, D.C. and in our state capitals throughout the entire nation. And when we talk about that, what we're talking about is not going in and, and repealing all regulation. It's about having common sense, reasonable regulatory oversight, but not going to the point that we're seeing out of Washington, D.C., that is letting go of common sense and regulating, in my opinion, for the sake of just regulating. That is not good government. We also believe that our tax code in America needs to be reformed. We have talked greatly about it, not only because it's the right thing to do, but also to create a marketplace in America that's going to be competitive worldwide because we are in the world economy. That is the reality of our world, and we need to recognize it, and we need to give our private sector those tools or that environment that allows us to compete on the world economic stage. And the fourth point that I think many of my colleagues here tonight hold near and dear, just like I do, 
is that we have to adopt and commit our nation to a comprehensive, domestic-orientated energy plan. Why is that important? Not only because of the national security interest that so many people can inherently latch on to. You know, we are importing about 9 million barrels of oil a day, coming from countries and sources that are publicly adverse and sworn enemies to the United States of America. So it just doesn't make sense. But a bigger issue, a second issue that needs to be articulated on the energy plan is that if we can grow a domestic, stable source of energy here in America, we will create a marketplace in America that can rely on long-term, stable, low-cost sources of energy. I can tell you as a small developer myself, when I looked at putting a project together, there were always three things I looked at in the private sector. I said, what are the taxes, what are the insurance costs, and what are the utility costs? And as a mayor of a small city, the city of Corning, my hometown in New York, when I met with developers who were looking to locate into our community, utility costs was always in that top three of concern. So if we can adopt and commit ourselves to a domestic oriented comprehensive energy plan, I am confident we can lower those costs so the American market can become competitive again. That means bringing back our manufacturers. That means building things here in America. And as my colleagues have articulated over and over again, government is not here to create jobs. That is not what our founding fathers envisioned. What the founding fathers envisioned was a government that preserved and protected the right to have the opportunity to succeed in one's life. Not a guarantee to succeed. Not one where the government is the, is the one signing the front of the paycheck but rather the individual is going out and earning that paycheck without interference from the government and from sources from the private sector. So I, I am so happy to be here with my colleagues this evening, and I join you proudly in this fight, in this philosophy of leadership that we have brought to Washington, D.C., and will continue this fight and continue the leadership out of this House chamber to stand for America, for our kids and our grandchildren, and make it again the land of opportunity that we have all enjoyed. With that, I yield back Thank to you my so colleague. much to the gentleman from New York. Before I call on the gentleman from Arkansas, I just want to make a point. There is a story about a, a, a company here in the United States trying to achieve exactly uh, what you are talking about. Uh, we know the private sector creates jobs, yet our friends on the other side of the aisle, all they're doing is standing in, in the way. Uh, we continue to lead, to deregulate. Recently, a startup company named Staxon, based in Ohio, uh, developed, prototyped, and patented an innovative new technology for shipping containers uh, that could save U.S. manufacturers, retailers, and sea, rail, and truck carriers millions of dollars annually by reducing the cost of moving and storing empty containers. Staxon raised about $1 million, all private money, uh, to hire five people, buy supplies, hire local welders, and build prototypes. The third party, party cost, attorneys, accountants, filing fees, printing, etc., of compliance with the relevant security regulations to raise $1 million in $30,000 dollar units from private individuals was over $75,000, enough to hire a full-time welder. He has expressed the need to make the regulatory barriers uh, to raising private investor startup money for innovative entrepreneurial companies like Staxon much lower while maintaining reasonable protections for private investors in large banking and investment companies. It is easier for an individual to get a credit card with a $30,000 limit or a home equity loan uh, for $30,000 than it is for the same person in this country, the United States of America, to decide to invest $30,000 in a United States startup company like Staxon, which goes directly to the point that you're making. Again, House Republicans continue to lead, but we don't see the same leadership on the other side of the aisle. And now I'd like to yield time to the gentleman from Arkansas. Thank you. I thank the gentlelady from Alabama. 
One of the ways that we in the House uh, are focused on creating an environment where the private sector can create jobs is by pushing the president to do something about the pending trade agreements. There are three pending trade agreements, one with Panama, one with Colombia, and one with South Korea. And all three of them are just sitting there, sitting there while other countries are developing relationships and increasing exports to these countries. Now, <clears throat> in January of last year, President Obama said, quote, if America sits on the sidelines while other nations sign trade deals, we will lose the opportunity to create jobs on our shores, end quote. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. The president recognized last year that we need to move quickly with regard to these agreements that will increase exports. Why? Because if we increase exports, we increase jobs. Some estimates say that if we pass these three trade agreements, that we will create hundreds of thousands of jobs. So it's not just important that we pass them. It's important that we pass them quickly. Why? Well, I sat down last week with the, uh, this past week, with the ambassador from Colombia. And he was talking about how his country has greatly increased trade with Europe. While they're waiting on the administration here in the United States to move on the agreement with their country so that we can increase our exports and do business more efficiently, create jobs in this country. He said, we're waiting. We're waiting for the administration to take action. We keep hearing it's coming. It's coming. We're working on it. But he knows that those are just words. We need to get these trade deals passed and in place so that we can compete. Right now, businesses from Europe are visiting South Korea, they're visiting Colombia, they're visiting Panama, and they're doing business. And the problem that we have, even if we ultimately get these agreements passed, and I certainly hope we will, we will have lost valuable time. It's not like flipping a switch. When the agreements are passed, everything is equal. We're competing with Europe for the business of Colombia or Panama or South Korea. It's not that easy. Why? Because while we are sitting on the sidelines waiting for these deals to be passed, the Europeans and others around the world are developing relationships. They're flying to these countries. They're meeting for lunch. They're touring their factories. They're exchanging business cards. They're signing contracts. All while we, while we sit idly by, waiting on the president to do something. The president talked about doing something on these deals last year. He recognized that if we don't do something, we're going to lose the ability to compete. But what has he done? Nothing. Talk is cheap, Mr. President. We are waiting on you to move these trade deals with Colombia, with South Korea, and with Panama. You want to do something that sends a signal to this country that you're serious about job creation, Mr. President? then get those deals passed. Get those deals passed. Get out of the way of our businesses and let them compete with Europe and other countries around the world so that they can create jobs. We're ready in this house. We're ready. 
We will help you get them passed. Just join us, Mr. President. Thank you for the time. I'd now like to uh, thank you for the, to the gentleman from Arkansas. I'd now like to yield to the gentleman from Indiana. Here with you all this evening and talking about uh, the situation that we are currently in in our country. I tell you what a sobering moment uh, being first elected to Washington and coming in and finding out the, the uh, budget situation that we currently face. Uh, this is about our kids and our grandkids' future. And, um, and I know for myself and, and all of you that that is why you run for office. That is why you ran to, to come to Washington is to address the challenges that we have here in, in Washington. It's hard to comprehend the, um, the budgeting that has, has been taking place over the past several years here in Washington, D.C. When we're all back at home and uh, we're facing a tough economy, we're facing a, a job market that is not that strong, uh, you know, our friends and family, we have people that we know personally that, uh, that are out of work and are, are trying to survive in a very fragile economy. And yet it seems like we come to Washington and uh, we, we explain the situation back home and it continues to fall on deaf ears. It falls on deaf ears at the White House. It falls on deaf ears on the other side of the aisle. It falls on deaf ears in the Senate. And, and, and ladies and gentlemen, I believe that this is a time for us. This is the greatest opportunity that we will have to change the way Washington works. You know, we talk a lot about the debt that we are facing here in this country, $14 trillion of debt. We have a debt ceiling. Uh, that, uh, that's that a vote that's coming up here before long. We're almost uh, maxed out the credit cards. And there's just no discussion, no real um, uh, fortitude to deal with the spending habits of Washington, D.C. Now, I can tell you that taxes and debt kills jobs. And if we want to get people back to work, we need to tackle both of those and address them in a meaningful way that will produce work for Americans. Well, I was in a budget committee meeting today, and it just is so um, surprising to me. And, and it just shows the, uh, the, the position of so many Washington politicians that they're out of touch with reality. And that when you have a $1.5 trillion deficit, the uh, quickest way for politicians in Washington is, well, let's just raise taxes. Well, taxes are going to kill. If any taxes go up in, in this economy, it's going to kill job creation. As my friend from um, Wisconsin was tell talking earlier about the comparison between uh, Walmart and Kmart, he hit the nail on the head. You raise prices, people are going to go somewhere else. And the solution to the Democrats here in Washington is, well, let's just raise taxes to pay for the uh, deficit that we have. Let me just give you a quick comparison, and I want to end uh, briefly here, is that if you're making about $2,000 a month, but you're spending $3,500 a month, you're in a pretty deep hole, and every American knows it. We all know that if you're spending $1,500 more than what you're taking in a month, that's a recipe for disaster and bankruptcy. That's where we are at in Washington. The federal government is spending $1,500 a month more in comparison to what we're taking in in a month. Now, their solution is taxes. Their solution is to increase the debt. Neither one of those is the right solution. I believe for us to get jobs back in our economy and, and job creators who are working, whether it's down at the McDonald's and it's the, uh, those who are going to be you know, making the Big Macs uh, there, there at McDonald's and providing a job for a high school kid or for a college kid, that's what people are looking for. They're looking for confidence in this market. Ladies and gentlemen, it's good to be with you this evening. I'm, uh, I'm thrilled that, you are so, you know, that you're here and that you are spreading the message of what needs to happen here in Washington. Look forward to more discussion. Thank you. And, you know, um, as we move into discussion now, I just, um, with the little bit of time that we have left, it's like owning a business that brings in $100,000 worth of profit, yet you owe the bank $400,000. I mean, that, again, goes to the example that you made about your household, uh, our businesses have, everyone has tightened their belts in this country, but for the federal government. I'd like to yield to the gentlelady from Washington. 
really interesting, the differences between how, there's two different philosophies competing here. One is government does it best, and the one you hear tonight is that the American people do it best. Uh, you know, this last week in the Small Business Committee, uh, Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner was there defending um, how slowly they have moved to make credit available to small businesses. Um, you know, I think about small business owners, is it Steak Burger uh, in Vancouver, they, you can get a great uh, steak burger there, steak sandwich, and you know, these are small businesses that are hiring uh, uh, young people, high schoolers, kids in college, um, and as they're trying to keep these, some of these part-time uh, minimum wage kids in, in jobs, right, keep get, um, it, it's making it harder for them when, when the Treasury Secretary believes that raising taxes is how we meet the spending bid here. I mean, it's just ridiculous. It's two fundamental, uh, uh, fundamentally different beliefs. We here on the House floor tonight believe that Americans can grow jobs and manage their own money much better uh, than the Treasury Secretary or than Washington, D.C. It's just plain, plain simple. So thank you. Thank you. I'll yield to the gentleman this from Illinois. A great example. I just want to say, look, this is a great example of freshmen that have come here from all different backgrounds uh, for the purpose of saving our country, saving our union. And uh, uh, we've seen a great diverse group here from different states, from different backgrounds. And, uh, and it really is amazing. I got to just say, standing here, I'm inspired by what, I, by what I'm seeing for the future of America. And uh, I really think we're going to go some places. I think we can not be second best anymore. You know, I don't think people have to say that America is going to be second best. Uh, we can always stay best. We can always. And, and again, it's these <clears throat> forums like this tonight. You know, I started at the beginning. Americans deserve the truth. And the, the, the strongest truth comes directly from the mouths of Americans who are feeling the pain in their homes and in their businesses. I yield to the gentleman from Wisconsin. Americans are sick of being lied to. We're going to level with the American people. Uh, we just had a joint economic hearing uh, a couple days ago, and we learned that it is 18% more expensive to manufacture in America as opposed to other countries. And that's outside of wages. That's our tax code and our regulations. It's more expensive to manufacture in America. That is policies uh, right here in Washington that are making it more expensive. That's absolutely wrong. And I, I got to tell you, as I had a chance to listen to uh, our colleagues uh, from the Democrat side of the aisle uh, go on about uh, tax breaks for big oil companies. I don't know if anyone uh, heard their great conversation about tax breaks for big oil companies. But uh, I just got here in January. I'm a freshman. Uh, I'm new to this. But uh, I don't recall us uh, passing any bills that had tax breaks for oil companies. And uh, they had control of this house for four years. Where were their bills to deal with tax breaks for big oil companies? I never saw them. Um, and, I, and I hear, I mean, I hear these, um, the, this commentary that tries to get people ginned up, and it, and it, keeps, it takes right off the ball, which is true job creation and making us more competitive in a global economy. And I'll yield and becoming, Thank you. And, and becoming uh, less dependent on Middle Eastern oil is all about these very energy bills that, again, we have shown uh, consistent leadership just in the six months that we've been in the majority. You know, I go to the gas pump. I pump gas in my car. I know how much it, ca how much it costs. I'm in the grocery store. I see the rising cost of food uh, as it relates to these energy costs. And yet again, today, we see the president dip into our oil reserves, which should be for, for emergencies, uh, and yet we're using it for politics at a time when this country must become less dependent on Middle Eastern oil. I yield to the gentleman from Colorado. Well, I thank the gentlelady. And, and what's amazing about the argument, today the president releases the oil from our emergency reserve. And yet yesterday on this very floor, uh, member, people were arguing that, oh, no, 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 we don't need new expansions in production. We don't need more oil bringing, bringing on, being put online in this country because that won't lower the price of, of fuel. And so yesterday they were saying that more supplies won't reduce the price of fuel, but today they're saying release the Strategic Petroleum Reserve because it'll re reduce the price of fuel. A very confused <laughs> argument. Very. Point well made. Very. Thank you so much. Yes, I'll go back yield. to the gentleman from And, and I think as we look at tapping into these oil reserves, what does that do to endanger the security of this country? Um, as uh, the gentlelady knows in, in the South, uh, whether it's tornadoes, uh, whether it's floods, or whether it's hurricanes, uh, things happen in the Gulf 
where we would have to tap into the uh, reserve because our energy supply could be at risk in here for political purposes to try to drive prices down uh, over the summer driving season, the president has tapped into that reserve. I think that's uh, absolutely unacceptable for political purposes, especially as we know that real risks come up that can cause us um, a need for that energy supply and a yield back. Thank you. I yield to the gentleman in Arkansas very quickly. I'd, I'd just like to, to say that there have been a lot of topics covered tonight from Medicare to debt to energy. They all relate to jobs. Whether we're talking about reducing the regulatory burden, revising the tax code, passing trade agreements, working on uh, energy development and becoming more energy independent or paying down the debt, they all relate to job creation and making this a country where the private sector can create jobs. Well, again, thank you to all of the uh, freshmen that are here tonight, the states that you represent, the districts you represent, uh, but we all are here to work for America, uh, for American jobs, and thank you for your time and I uh, look forward to doing this again soon. With that, I yield back and uh, Mr. Speaker, I make a motion to adjourn. All right. The question is on the motion to adjourn. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. According to accordingly, the House stands, in, uh, stands adjourned until 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. Thank you. Today in the House, members passed a bill making changes to patent laws. The measure revises the patent issuing process